Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shot episode 301, which is a basically a makeup episode. As you recall, uh, last week I lost a big chunk of my Chris Avalon uh, interview, the part where he was talking about Siege of Dragon Spear, the new Baldur's Gate expansion, which is uh, you know the most exciting thing to happen in uh, at least my little world of gaming for quite some time. Anyway, uh, Chris had found out what happened and agreed to uh, come back on and redo that part of the interview. I mean, it's a really stand-up guy. I'm really happy about this, and I know you will too. So we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chris Avalon. Hello, folks. I am here once again with the great Chris Avalon, who's been uh, gracious enough to come back on the show. As you know, we had a little mishap last time, but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, Chris is cool like that. He's... Uh, happy to come back and try it again. And this time, I got a good feeling it will all go smoothly. <laughs> anyway, how are you on this uh, fine Saturday, Chris? I am doing great, man. I feel a little bit bad about the uh, the audio mishap last time. I feel like I infected you with my technological curse, where I feel like any technology I get close to just breaks down or fails. And maybe that's the story of my life. I don't know. But I'm, I'm happy to help you fix that today. I felt really bad when I heard about it. Uh, no, nothing, totally not your fault. Uh, the glitch was all mine, so... I don't know. It could have been my fault. Maybe it's like latent electrokinesis or something. I don't know. We'll blame but it I... on Ravel. Oh, thanks, Ravel. You always <laughs> ruin everything. I hear whatever your eyes see, your hands make broken. Thanks, Ravel. Well, anyway, Chris, everybody wants to know about this little project we've been hearing about, this uh, Baldur's Gate expansion, uh, the first one after... How many years has it been? You know, I don't even remember. Uh, it's been so long, I think, that when I heard they were going to do a brand new one, I just got excited about it. I'm like, oh my god, there's going to be a, like a new story in Baldur's Gate? I'm like, all right, I'm there. And if I get a chance to see it before anybody else, that also kind of appealed to my selfish nature. Because I'm like, oh my, and I also get like the first look at it. I'm like, oh, yay. <laughs> it's looking really great in the, the little trailers and stuff that are up on the site. Yeah. So what can, you, what can you tell us about this uh, Siege of Dragon Spear? Well, there's a few things. Uh, so when uh, they contacted me, uh, Trent and the lead designer, Philip, uh, Philip Daigle, they asked, they, they've been doing, they've been sort of working on the game so long that what they wanted was sort of a fresh perspective. And they're like, hey, well, would you be willing to spend like a few hours just, you know, checking out the game and, you know, if you had any thoughts in the storyline or what we're trying to do, we'd, you know, we'd really appreciate your feedback. And, you know, my selfish monkey brain was like, oh, yeah, I definitely want to check this out. This should be good. And um, so I played it through. Uh, it was probably about 25 or 30 hours. Uh, and that's that didn't have all the content in it, which was the first thing that kind of surprised me because it's actually bigger than either of the other Baldur's Gate expansions. And I think it's actually bigger than both of those expansions combined, which is a hell of an effort. And then um, I was a little surprised because I wasn't sure what they would do between Baldur's Gate 1 and Baldur's Gate 2. But it did occur to me that there's sort of a thread left hanging at the beginning of Baldur's Gate 2 where... You know, they they make mention of you know there's there's some uh, you know uh, d dark tragedy that makes you depart Baldur's Gate or under under dark and mysterious circumstances, and that sort of is where you is it's basically all you really have of Baldur's Gate before Baldur's Gate Two starts. And uh, Siege of Dragon Spirit answers that question, which is pretty cool. Uh, and so I I went through, I played through it, I gave feedback on the story, I told them all the points that I thought were really, really strong. Uh, and uh, I, there were a lot of points I was actually pretty jealous about. I was I was maybe more than a little upset, but I calmed down. Uh, but overall, uh, it was providing like narrative feedback, uh, story elements, uh, comments on elements I thought they did well from the Infinity Engine games. Like, for example, they made an effort to include optionally tough combat encounters which was sort of one of the hallmarks of Icewind Dale 2 like uh, I mean uh, not I mean Icewind Dale TOO not specifically the second one and they have a really good sense of like we'll expose you to a potentially hard encounter and you have a choice of whether you want to interact with it or not but we're letting you know it's going to be a hard fight right now and 
I got real, I, I like seeing elements like that. And even though my party got their asses kicked quite a few times because I'm such a good role playing game player, uh, it was still a lot of fun to be able to just sort of have those optional combat. So I gave a feedback on all that stuff. Um, the main writing was was all done by the Beam Dog writers. Uh, it was um, Amber Scott who used to do um, work on Dungeons and Dragons, and it was also Andrew Foley who they got from uh, graphic novels and movies, and both of them did a really good job of matching the tones of like the original Baldur's Gate characters, and they also did a great job of introducing new characters who I also liked a lot. Like they, they have this one female goblin shaman (laughs) with a lot of adjectives and she's great. Like every single instance where I'm like, Oh, you know, her name's McKen. Um, and, uh, whenever I was in a situation where I'm like, well, you know, McKen would probably say something right here. She always does. And the things were always strangely, wise and intelligent, which I wasn't used to from goblins. And uh, it also was kind of touching in a number of respects. She had, she had a lot of reactivity. It was pretty cool. So I, I really enjoyed, I enjoyed seeing elements like that. I thought they did a, a really good job with it, and I told them so. Yeah, I've always been a big fan of gnomes and goblins. Yeah, I don't think you'll be disappointed, Matt. Uh, as soon as you encounter her in Siege, you definitely get her in your party because she has some of the best lines. And they're even better because they're sort of like, they're, they're wise and intelligent, but then they're delivered with goblin speak, so the the contrast there is really good. I, th- I thought they did a really good job with that. Uh, so you'd mentioned that some of the things really upset you. What were those uh, elements? Yeah, so I have to confess, maybe this is because uh, maybe I I've fallen into a rut, or maybe I'm used to some cliches when it comes to role playing game villains. But what I thought they did really well in Siege was they introduced an antagonist and not a villain. And what I mean by that is the main character, uh, uh, Kalar, the Shining Lady, she's actually not a villain. She's more of a foil and a rival because her whole presentation is when you figure out what's going on, which you will find out pretty early on, she's actually just being a better protagonist than you are. She's being a better hero. And when you... When you're sort of riding the wave after what happened with Baldur's Gate, you know, and you're talking like with the the lords of Baldur's Gate, who are not not a very upright, solid bunch of moral people, encountering her was actually kind of like having a bucket of water thrown in my face because I'm like, wow, you know what? Um, She's making a lot of sense right now. And the people, you know, that I'm kind of allied with aren't really the best bunch of people, even though they might be the best people for the situation and then I felt kind of guilty and then I'm like oh wow they made me have this emotional reaction to this villain and they also made me jealous of her and then I felt guilty and I'm like I'm having all these range of emotions I don't usually have when confronting an antagonist so I thought they did a really really good job with that oh, that sounds almost games of Game of Thrones-ish level of uh, complexity to all of Yeah, I, and they also did a good job making sure that you get a chance to have conversations with her early, which I think is really important when dealing with a, you know, the, with a primary like NPC antagonist. It, it's good to have some sort of conversation about their agenda and motivations, and that, that put the rest of the adventure in context. Um, and I was also jealous because they could have done a lot of shortcuts with the storyline. Like they could have said, Hey, we're just going to ignore Baldur's Gate and, you know, not waste any time or resources supposedly exploring the city that you just helped save. Or they could have said, Hey, well, we're just going to ignore anything that happened with Saravok and like, you know, reduce that to a one sentence summary. But they don't do any of that. Like they make you very aware of wrapping up all the wreckage that Saravok has left behind. They've also, do a good job of letting you explore the new city that you helped save and seeing all the reactions to that and also the reactions of people realizing that you and Saravok, you know, were basically, he's, he's your brother. Wow, but he was threatening Baldur's Gate, you know, and if that's, if it's true what they're saying, that you two are related, well, that sounds kind of odd. And then the way they build that, I started feeling a little bit apprehensive about being in the city, which I think was, was, was certainly the goal. But it helped put your relationship with Baldur's Gate and its citizens in more context. And seeing that kind of reactivity was really cool. Well, I know you're, fan, of course, a big fan of the first Baldur's Gate and the second Baldur's Gate. So just as a, sort of a Baldur's Gate fan, what is it that excites you the most about this uh, new project? Uh, getting to adventure with my friends again. 
Yeah, the, uh, his characters are back. Yeah, they're back. And one of the big challenges, I think, for any writer is you have to match the tone sometimes of characters that have, have been the province of another writer. And I think both uh, Amber and Andrew, they nailed all the old characters in terms of uh, their dialogue style, uh, their presentation. And uh, I was pretty impressed. I, I didn't notice any disconnects from anything that the old Baldur's Gate companions had. And even better, they were aware enough of what happens, obviously, in Baldur's Gate 2, that they have a lot of foreshadowing elements as to why people's attitudes change, like what sort of training sequences people are going to if they shift classes and things like that. Well, here's a question that I, from uh, submitted by uh, one of my viewers, Master Gradius, and he was asking about uh, what enhancements have been made or improvements to the, to the interface and to the pathfinding routines. Sure. I think uh, Beam, Beam Dog realized there was um, a lot of work to do with optimizing the pathfinding code. So they made a top priority element to examine that. Uh, they looked for every special case that people were encountering, as well as internally in the studio. They, they crushed those special cases. They fixed those. And they also re-examined the pathing code from an, like a high-level perspective, and they just saw about optimizing it. And I will say that while playing Siege, I was feeling those improvements quite a bit. I didn't really notice any pathfinding issues. Um, so that was a big priority from them. I think they took the feedback from the community very, very seriously. Um, they did a lot of interface improvements, um, a lot of which I loved. Uh, they, they include a lot of health bars like directly on the uh, world map screen. Um, and being able to see your health bars for your characters without having to let's say, glance off to the right uh, was actually hugely helpful. I mean, like voice barks always help when you know someone's taking damage, but it's, it's helpful to see that information directly in front of you as well as the enemy health bars. So that, that was convenient. Another nice convenience they did was whenever you pick up an item in the game, they actually highlight the character portraits for who can use it or who's the best to use it. And that made transferring items around between the characters a lot easier because I'm like, oh, okay, well, this particular character can use the tower shield or large shield and I don't have to continually go back, you know, and then dump that item in every single person's inventory to see whether it's going to be like red lit or not. And that was, that was a nice sort of convenience feature that, uh, that made me really happy. I mean, there was still a lot of fun of moving around inventory items. So I actually really enjoyed doing that stuff. <laughs> Uh, but having that convenience feature was was pretty nice, and they they add like a pop up journal, um, and uh, yeah, just like a lot of, like a lot of, lot of little mods they brought in from the community. I, I think I think one nice thing that Beam Dog does is uh, not only do they pay attention to the community, but they also pay attention to mods and modders, and then even better, and I wish more studios would do this. Uh, they actually go out and hire those modders. Like they contract them, they bring them on board, they make them part of the experience. I mean, they recognize that these people are making modifications to this game because they love the game. And the, the modifications that are being suggested are great ones. Like uh, we had a similar experience on Neverwinter Nights 2 where we just recognized that, um, for example, the, the AI systems that have been developed by the community were were superior to you know what you know what we, we had had the studio. So we just ended up, you know grabbing the modder and we're like hey we, you know we want to make use of your ai system it is it is excellent and everyone respects it and seeing them reach out to the community like that and make them part of the team i think is awesome yeah that is really awesome I and mean, i'm feeling really confident that the the Baldur's gate legacy has found itself in really excellent hands uh with you and beam dog uh just one last question here uh, sure. uh, you know is there what are your thoughts at this point on some kind of a third Baldur's gate Oh man, I I have been waiting for a Baldur's Gate three for a long. I'm sure everyone has, but uh, I I don't know anything about it. But if there's ever a potential to do more stories in the Baldur's Gate universe, I I definitely want to be involved because uh, you know playing Siege sort of brought all the nostalgia feels back <laughs> while I was playing. Like oh man, this is you know this is, you know I feel like I'm you know <laughs> a teenager again playing these games, and I'm like oh it, it's all well not teenager but maybe early twenties. It still feels like teenager times, but I, I I love the experience with Siege, and if there was a chance to do like a more, you know, extended version of a Baldur's Gate story that you know, within that same universe, I'd I'd definitely be up for it. I I think the Baldur's Gate 
series still has a lot of legs. I, th- I think people still, you know, have a lot of love for that game. And I think it also makes itself felt in various Kickstarters as well, where if people see that you know it has Baldur's Gate elements, they even get, they get even more excited about the Kickstarter. And I think that speaks to sort of the legacy that Baldur's Gate left behind. It's just it's just a, a strong RPG series. It's one of the best. Well, thanks again, Chris. It's been really fun. Uh, excellent. Uh, uh, thanks again for coming back on. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to mention about the game that we haven't covered here? Uh, yeah, actually, um, when they said Siege of Dragonspear, uh, I thought that they would take the easy way out, and they don't. Uh, there are epic battle sequences, and when I say epic, I mean it feels like you're in the middle of a war. And I appreciated that they, they did that, and you'll probably see more combatants on a screen in a warlike situation than I think you've ever seen in a Defend the Engine game before, and it's awesome. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, By the way, I know this episode was a little shorter than usual. I had the I got about 40 minutes left on my Bartle uh, interview with uh, Richard Bartle of Mud. Uh, so what I thought I would do is just keep this one short, and then the next one will be sort of a a longer, extended episode, whatever you want to call it. And I'll just put the whole I just do the all the rest of the Bartle interview on one uh, big episode. So if you feel a little short change this time, uh, don't worry. The next episode will make up for it. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of Matt Chat. Really, really means a lot to me, guys. You have no idea. It is awesome uh, that you guys want to keep these episodes coming. Uh, now, if you would like to uh, support Matt Chat and you haven't done it already, uh, just go over to the Patreon site. Remember, guys, I'm not asking for a lot of money here. You know, a buck a show was fine <laughs> and greatly appreciated. So, thank you. So, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Well, quite a bit of news this week. Uh, Neil, first up, uh, Neil Halford. Remember, I interviewed him a couple of times, actually. He's now providing story consultation services. Now, if you don't know who Neil is, I'll go watch the interview. But basically, he's the uh, man behind the Betrayal at Crondor story, uh, which is really one of the best stories in, in any uh, role-playing game I've played. Uh, plus, he did a book called Swords and Circuitry. So basically, th- this guy really knows what he's talking about. Uh, so if you have a story idea, you need some help with it, uh, go talk to him. It's 40 bucks. I'll put the link in the show notes for you. Uh, that's Neil Holford. Uh, also, Shane Stacks, and in a, I got a couple of news items uh, about him. Uh, one is he passed along this thing about China lifting the ban on consoles. You know, I didn't even know they had a ban on video game consoles, so it shows you how uh, ill-informed I am of the Chinese <laughs> gaming scene, whatever. Uh, but apparently they still had ways to get consoles. It wasn't totally restricted, but uh, they basically just got rid of all the all the prohibitions, I suppose. Uh, and a lot of people are excited about this because, you know, China's a pretty big place with lots and lots of people. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on. And let's see. Also, uh, Shane had Chris Avalon uh, on that show as well. So if you didn't get enough of, uh, of Chris Avalon here on Match yet, go check out uh, Shane Plays Radio. It's also a podcast. I'll put the link also in the show notes. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, Thamer sent in an item about Bioware. It's a little blog editorial piece about why uh, Bioware games are sort of uniquely popular. They have a unique uh, fan base. Pretty interesting read. Uh, for example, they, she's arguing that the uh, those games pay a lot more attention to deep female friendships uh, than typical games. I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's, I have to admit, it's not something I really have thought much about, so I'm glad that Bioware is doing that, though. That's pretty cool. Oh, and then finally, uh, Adam Dayton sent in a news item about Arcs Fatalis. This is a, a little uh, RPG. I'm not sure what year this came out. Kind of in a Looking, looking Glass Studio-style uh, game, Ultima Underworld thing. And they got a weekend, weekend deal on Steam right now. You can pick this up for only $2.99. Hopefully you'll see this episode in time to grab that because uh, it's only got about 18 hours left. But anyway, well, it looks pretty good. I went ahead and picked it up, <laughs> you know, for three bucks. Come on. 
All right, what about that ale of the week? Well, this week I was back talking to old Reese over at the Coburn's uh, liquor store. And he pointed this one out to me. This is a Woot Stout. It's Drew Curtis, Will Wheaton, and Greg uh, Coke. Uh, Stone Farking uh, Wheaton. You know, of course, who Will Wheaton is. That's uh, uh, Wesley Crusher from Star Trek, the next generation. Uh, this is a collaboration ale. Let's see, 13% alcohol. Okay, there's a huge write-up on the back here. Let's see if I can get to the crux of the matter. Let's see. Okay, so in celebration of the third brewing of this annual offering, we added to the mix a version of last year's vintage that we aged in bourbon barrels for a year. Consider it a superhero version of that Sudsy staple of HopCon, our imaginatively titled annual July Wootstout <laughs> release event. Uh, personalized stamp on this year's edition of Wootstout. Comic book cover artist Dave the Reverend Johnson, uh, the Eisner Award winner. So apparently they had a comic book artist do the label on this bottle, so that's pretty cool. Lots more stuff, but I'm not going to read that whole thing. Uh, let's see, drink fresh or age at cellar temperature. Wow. Ale brewed with cocoa, pecan, sweet, and rye with one quarter aged in bourbon barrels. So, you know, you'd think this would be a really expensive uh, beer, but it was not that bad. I think I paid maybe eight bucks for this. Uh, but, you know, some of these can run a lot more for these special uh, limited runs. So, anyway, I'm pretty excited about this. So, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of uh, this Woot Stout here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, smells fantastic. You can definitely smell that bourbon uh, from those bourbon barrels. Actually, it's a lot more pronounced than I thought, which is uh, kind of uh, interesting. You know, it didn't have, a, I think they said maybe a quarter was brewed in that. But anyway, you definitely smell the bourbon. Uh, there's a cherry aroma here, kind of a, I think they mentioned cocoa. You know, I can, I, th I think I can detect that as well. It's kind of a chocolatey uh, scent to it. It smells quite nice. Uh, you definitely smell the bourbon. Uh, so let's give it a taste. <clears throat> you definitely taste the bourbon. It tastes like a uh, really strong uh, scotch flavors to this sort of a cherry uh, taste to that. What, what else is going on there? It's kind of a, I guess that must be the pecans and the cocoa I'm tasting there. There's, there's some kind of unusual uh, flavors to this. Let me try it uh, again here. It's definitely strong. Uh, you definitely taste the alcohol in this. You taste that sort of a burnt pecan-like flavor, if you like pecan pies. Um, yeah, that's sort of, it's kind of a bitter aftertaste. You get a lot of a cherry sweet uh, aftertaste to it. Really thick and creamy. You know, I gotta say, I'm really enjoying this. It's a very sophisticated uh, taste. I'll try it one more time here. It's a, uh, I actually really, really like this. It's definitely strong. There's a lot of flavor. It's a, uh, I guess, what do we call that? A smoky uh, sort of flavor to this. Very sophisticated. Uh, you'll be tasting all sorts of things, uh, and they're all good unless you don't like the. <laughs> if you if you really hate the taste of alcohol and bitterness, you'd stay away. But otherwise, I think this is a really solid choice. Really happy about this. Uh, really happy with it. So I'm gonna give this a full five out of five drinking horns for the Woot Stout. Uh, good job, Wesley, on this. Uh, really, really good stuff. So for the quote, I was looking for quotes about sieges, and believe it or not, there are quite a few quotes about sieges. I guess there's lots of quotes about any topic you can imagine. Now this is by uh, Virginia Woolf, even though I could swear, I could have sworn it was by uh, Morrissey. Uh, but it goes something like this. One likes people much better when they're battered down by a prodigious siege of misfortune than when they triumph. See you guys next week. How about 
global thermonuclear war. Would you prefer a good game, Marshall?